What's good, Knicks Nation? Alex Jeteris here, aka the Tratocaster, back again with another Game of the Week preview. This time we are previewing once again the New York Knicks facing the Indiana Pacers, not once but twice this week. First time will be tomorrow at the Gainbridge Fieldhouse in Indiana, and then once again on Friday at Madison Square Garden. And with me today to preview this game is none other than Caitlin Cooper, aka a rock star. She had an article dropped about her last week. You used, you used to find her work over at Indy Cornrows. Now, now she's got her own site, creator of basketball. She wrote, obviously there's some Agatha Christie uh, background there, but we appreciate all that. Thank you, Caitlin, for coming on to the show today and make sure Knicks Nation to hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Actually for, for everybody, right? Not just the boys, ladies, everybody. Cause we got Caitlin with her today. I'm so used to saying that Caitlin. So used to saying that because usually CP, JD and myself, uh, but make sure to hit that thumbs up button for all of us today. And remember that this show is sponsored by KnicksFanTV.com. All right, Kaylin, we're here to preview this game, but first and foremost, how are you doing today? You know, you had your article dropped about you yesterday, which was a fantastic read. Got to learn more about you, but how are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm always excited to talk to Nick fans. I always feel like of all the shows that I do in other markets, the Nick fans are always the most passionate fan base. I have quite a few Nick followers, so I really enjoy that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And it's fun because... I think one, the historic rivalry, right? Between the the Pacers and the Knicks. So there's always something good there. And at the same time, people follow you because your work is just, it's just fantastic. I mean, we're going to discuss the article that was written about you and dropped yesterday, but your work is just, you know, always rock solid, always learning something new, whether it's Benedict Matherin's jab step, Tyrese Halliburton's uh, jump passing, you know, all that stuff. So just a great insight to the game of basketball from you as always. But Bef let's start this. Let's start this preview off. How do you feel about the New York Knicks? What, what are your thoughts about them this season? The Knicks are better than I thought they were going to be for sure. I did a preview pod with Adam Spinell over at the Box and One where we did like Eastern Conference seating rankings. And as I recall, I was thinking about this last night when you sent me the outline. I think I had the Knicks in the play-in tournament. I think I had them in like the seven-eight hole. So they've mm -hmm. definitely exceeded my expectations. And like, to be honest, it looks pretty solid that the Knicks are going to play the Cavs in the first round. I, we all think that's going to be the matchup. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if that's fully been locked in yet, but I think that's my most anticipated first round matchup in either conference. I just think that there's a lot of fun chess match there. In addition to obviously there's narratives between, you know, the Knicks didn't trade for Donovan Mitchell, Jalen Brunson win at Donovan Mitchell last year in the Mavs jazz series. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there's going to be a lot of fun dynamics there. And I, those games have been fun to watch. I didn't get to catch all of the one last week between the Knicks and the the Cavs. I saw part of it, but like the idea of, you know, a Coro potentially having length on Brunson and what can RJ Barrett do if he has a smaller guard on him? Like, I just think there's a lot of fun, uh, little independent moving parts between those two teams. Yeah. It's going to be, it's going to be a lot of fun just because as you said, all the narratives that come with it, but I think the chess match is just in two inexperienced teams. You know, besides Donovan Mitchell and Jalen Brunson, who have a lot of playoff experience, both both most of the roster on both of those teams don't, and it'll be interesting to see who can rise to the occasion. Um, but I like you was in the same position to start off the season, thinking that they were somewhere like I thought Max they can get to the six six seed, like if everything hit right. But totally, you know, things that we didn't account for: the Josh Hart trade, Brooklyn blowing everything up, and then you know them doing a full on, I don't even know what they're doing right now. I mean, I'm a Kyle Bridges out there dropping 30, 40 points, just one uh, Eastern conference player of the week. So there's a lot of stuff going on over there, but yeah, totally for the Knicks. It's been all, it's been definitely interesting. Has there been one part of this season for the Knicks that's really stood out to you? I think more so than anything, especially in the matchups with the Pacers is how much impact Grimes has had, like mm. particularly defending at the point of attack against Halliburton. Like when he was healthy in the, two games ago like even when Halliburton rejects a screen and goes away from it Grimes was still able to beat him to his spot I mean I think that's honestly what led to the play at the end of the game where Halliburton ended up isolating against Julius Randle that kind of caused all the mm -hmm. hullabaloo afterward because like I think they were just having so much trouble with Mitchell and Grimes and the drop coverage that they decided you know it's not necessarily the best tactic to isolate against Julius Randle on an island over on the corner but I think that's honestly why they went to it so I've really enjoyed watching Quentin Grimes this season and then also like you know Emmanuel quickly coming into his own it's been really 
fun to see. Like that's kind of what's great about the Knicks is that they've had these individual performances from different guys on different nights where, you know, quickly can go get 40 for you. And, mm-hmm. you know, Julius Randle can have a big game against the Miami heat. And then you can have, you know, Jalen Brunson last week against the Cavs going off for, you know, close to what was it? 40. Did he go for 40 in that game too? He did go for 40. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So like, it, you just never know which guy is really going to be able to pop off for you on a given night. So I've enjoyed that aspect of it as well. Yeah, I mean, as a Knicks fan, that's what I enjoy, too. And it's interesting that you brought up Quentin Grimes because we brought on your uh, former co-host, Mark Schindler, not too long ago when we did the Pacers preview way back. And uh, he also mentioned how he liked Quentin Grimes on the roster, too. So it's cool to hear some similarities in, in who you both appreciate on the Knicks roster. Moving along to the Pacers, though, what have, what have, what has your thoughts been about that season, their season so far? I mean, I think it kind of settled back down into what people anticipated. They were really over exceeding expectations in the early going, hit a skid over a seven game West Coast road trip where they were still starting Jalen Smith and Miles Turner together. And it kind of became clear that, hey, this isn't workable. Like centers were being cross matched onto Jalen. That was really impacting their offensive production during that stretch where, you know, now wings are back on Miles Turner, making it easier to switch those pick and rolls. And so when they get back from the road trip, I thought Rick Carlisle was pretty shrewd to make the decision that hey we're going to try to start you know playing really small and playing Aaron Neesmith at the four spot and they really kind of took off from there and and I was thinking you know this is a lot better than I ever expected this team to be they they won I think eight of ten games they had some solid wins over like the Clippers and the Heat and you know the season honestly changed after they lost that game to the Knicks after the Wally Zerbiak incident that's where it kind of turned around then you know Tyrese ends up getting hurt shortly thereafter on that 10 game stretch and Mm -hmm. then they they plummeted from there and then he came back and they had a couple decent wins but he's been in and out of the lineup and now it kind of feels like they've settled back into especially over these last five games where now we're back in development modes. We're getting, you know, Benedict Mathern into the starting lineup in place of Buddy Heald. It's not so much about winning or losing. Like if they do win, they have beat the Thunder. They have beat the Raptors with these depleted lineups, but it's more about guys getting experience. And that was where expectations were set before the season started. Okay. And with Buddy Heald, that's interesting because where do you see him fitting into this rotation moving forward? Or not the rotation, but this team moving forward because he brings that shooting that this team really needs especially when you have Halliburton getting downhill what do you what do you expect his outlook for this future yeah I mean the the chemistry between Tyrese and Buddy has been really important all season for a long stretch of the year they were the number one assist combo in the NBA Tyrese to Buddy and like they're not a team that really likes to isolate so Buddy Heald's pretty important in their scheme in terms of like if they if Halliburton gets a switch they'll have Buddy come go screen that switch to create a little bit of hesitation he's a very smart stack screener he's very good at moving and relocating better than anybody else on the roster but he is on an expiring contract they obviously have a lot of guards that's why they're playing like eight guard lineups in part it was more feasible for them but also they got a find playing times for guys. I mean, they just drafted Chris Duarte last year. He's a guy that's had, you know, somewhat of a slumping season, but I mean, it will be interesting to see how they evaluate that because they have bumped Benedict over Buddy into the starting lineup. I think just to see, you know, him get some reps against top tier guys, they throw the ball to him more, some in some isolation situations, have him assigned to top defenders. So it is possible that they could move on from there, but I do think that what Buddy brings in terms of playing alongside Tyrese is pretty important. So would you expect, because you dra- the Pacers drafted Benedict Matherin, would you expect Matherin to come off the bench again the following season? Because that would be interesting to have, you know, a lottery uh, a lottery player just sticking on the bench and being part of the bench unit. Yeah, I mean, it's worked this year, and I understand why Rick Carlisle's done it, because Benedict's usage changes by about eight percentage points when he plays with Tyrese versus when he doesn't. So him coming off the bench has allowed him to have more space to get more shots and do more with the ball in his hands than if he had been in the starting lineup. And also, I think that there's been somewhat of a dynamic, too, where, you know, he they play a game against the heat and Benedict only plays 13 minutes. And some of that is an accountability thing for his defense and wanting him to earn, you know, getting into the starting lineup and wanting him to earn what minutes he gets. They're not just unconditional Mm. with him. So that's been part of it. But I, for me personally, I would be prepared to start Benedict next year. I think they need to move into that phase and start building the chemistry between Tyrese and Benedict. Because even now, like Benedict is in the starting lineup, but Tyrese Halliburton probably isn't going to play again this season. So I think it's important to make that switch. And then, you know, if you are going to be playing both of the two of them together because of what each of their defensive limitations are to a degree, I think you're going to start Andrew Nemhard still because he brings a lot to them defensively. So that's why I said it would, if, if Buddy stays on the roster i kind of suspect that it will be off the bench but that's just an inkling on my part interesting considering that buddy didn't like that out in sacramento you know he wants to be a starter but 
as you talked about, you got Andrew Nebhard, you got Tyrese Halburn, you got Benedict Matherin. That's kind of the core moving forward. And right. Isn't that yeah. what you want to see Indiana do the following season? Yeah. And then that brings up the whole question of everyone we just mentioned. We didn't mention Chris Duarte. Yeah. So, you know, what do you, what do you expect about Chris Duarte? I thought there was gonna be a trade for Obi Toppin and Chris Duarte in all honesty, because when I read from heavy.com earlier that there was some talks between Obi top, like for the Knicks and the Pacers regarding Obi Toppin, I thought that was going to be a trade that we would see because Obi hasn't gotten that much playing time, even though he's getting that right now with Julius Randle out towards the end of the season. That was something that I was expecting. Yeah, I mean, they're both kind of in similar positions with their respective teams, right? Where, you know, mm -hmm. you, you think Obi maybe be able to do more in a different system, and especially in Indiana, you know, the Pacers have the second highest transition frequency in the NBA. He's obviously very electric in the open floor. He's never got to play with a big like Miles Turner, you know, He's always been out there with whether it's Nerlens Noel or Mitchell Robinson, somebody who's going to be around the basket. Miles can space out to three. Um, and just also being able to play with Tyrese Halliburton, obviously, is a, is a big help to anybody who plays out there. So I could see the situation where the environment would be better for him here. He's not playing behind Julius Randle if he comes to Indiana. They don't have people at the four spot, really, anybody at the traditional four spot. But I could see some of that what was going on with Jalen repeating itself in terms of, you know, would opposing teams start putting their fives on top and, and putting their wings on miles if that was a starting front court combination. But like I was with you, I, I wouldn't have been surprised if that came down just because I, you know, I think to a degree, Chris might've had a better situation in New York too, because Chris overall has not been healthy for the majority of the season. Even in the games that he plays, he looks a little bit hampered to my eye, but I think he misses Sabonis more than anybody else on the roster mm. does. He doesn't get downhill as well out of handoff situations as what Benedict can do with his defender trailing in and of himself. So Sabonis was the number one assist person to Duarte last year, and that included at the rim. So if he could play off of somebody, I know they don't do as much of that anymore now that they have Brunson in the lineup, but if he could play off of Randall and do some of that two-man game, I think that that would be beneficial to restore some of that for him. So um, yeah, I thought that that was plausible for both teams to have made that deal. Yeah, I, I'm just, we'll see what happens this off season, because if you're looking at the Indiana Pacers right now, 12 out of 15 players on their roster are under contract for the following season, including Buddy Heald. So let's move along to that because we, once again, that whole nucleus of Halbert and Nebhard and Matherin is what you want to see on Indiana. What are your expect, expectations for this off season, considering that Indiana is done with the season, they're trying to get into the Wemby sweepstakes. What would you expect for Indiana to do this upcoming offseason to reshape this roster? Right. So, I mean, I think what you just said is pretty key. They have 12 players under contract already, and they have three first-round draft picks. They have their own, the pick from Boston from the Malcolm Brogdon trade, mm -hmm. and then, you know, and the pick from Cleveland from last year when they traded Karis LeVert. Now that Cleveland's locked into the playoffs, that will be their pick as well. So those aren't super high picks, but they do. Are they going to want to draft three more young guys when most of this roster is already young? Or is there potentially a consolidation move there? So there were rumors that they had talked to Toronto about OG on an OB. I think that OG is a perfect fit for them at the four. But, you know, is Toronto still in, in that type of mindset now that they've mm. added Jakob Pertl and they looked a little bit more like buyers and they clearly want to evaluate what they're going to do in the play-in tournament, potentially the playoffs as well. So I do think that them having three firsts is something to watch and whether they would consolidate that. And what we already said about Duarte and Buddy, I could see a scenario where one or the other of them isn't still on the roster next year. And then they kind of had this weird thing going on where they have a rotating backup big rotation where mm. Ijax and Jalen Smith trade nightly, which one of them is going to start in place of Miles Turner because they're both just sharing one position, which is to say nothing of Daniel Tice, who is also on an expiring contract. So I kind of suspect that one to two of those bigs also will no longer be on the roster next year too. Mm. And bringing up Miles Turner, you know, just got the extension. How'd you feel about that when you saw that happen? Because I've never seen a player in so many trade rumors and then stay with the same organization. So what were your thoughts when that happened? Yeah, it always seems like from an outsider perspective that the Pacers like to package that as they're not shopping Miles, that they're more so listening to offers about Miles. But, you know, when you go and sign DeAndre Ayton to a max offer sheet, that suggests that you're that you're looking for an upgrade at that position last summer. So I thought after that happened, honestly, I didn't really think that Miles was going to be on the roster at the beginning of the season. And if he was, it was going to be solely to recoup his value after the foot injury, kind of like what they had to do with Victor Oladipo a few years ago. And it was pretty clear, mm -hmm. like, hey, you're not going to resign here. Like, they're just bringing you back in order so that they could trade him ultimately to Houston when they got Karis LeVert. So 
I kind of anticipated that was going to be the situation with Miles, especially after he did the podcast with Adrian Wojnarowski, which a lot of people are like, well, what else was he going to say? I'm like, well, I've never really heard a player talk about, you know, whether another team should trade for him or not publicly on a podcast. So it definitely looked like that was what way that was going to head that, you know, by mid season, I thought he was going to be on a different team. So I was very surprised that that all was able to work together. And especially because, you know, he's also never been out of the first round of the playoffs and it doesn't really look like the Pacers are necessarily in that trajectory, especially not this year, but maybe not next year either. So um, it was very beneficial for both teams. I mean, it looks like a big chunk of money, but ultimately, you know, he got a raise this season, but over the fi- the next two, it's only like slightly above the 18 million he was already making. I think it's like 20 and 21 million. So he can be able to get back out, get back out in the TV deal. He'll still be under 30 when he goes out to the next contract. And for the Pacers, it's worked out really well. Like this is definitely the best season of his career. He's done things I haven't seen him do in a Pacer uniform before. The relationship with him and Tyrese Halliburton has worked better than I expected. I didn't think that pairing was going to be as good as what could have been the case with Aiton because for Miles' career, especially even when he started at the five the last time, he's not a big who typically rolls to the basket. He's never rolled on more than 50% of his screens. Mm. So Tyrese being somebody who dribbles off the pick and is more, you know, prefers to survey rather than punching it to the rim, I thought was going to pair better with a rim roller, but that's come into play. And the two of them have found decent chemistry in the pick and roll. And obviously what Miles does defensively is pretty important when you have Tyrese on the floor at the other end too. So, um, all worked out much better than I anticipated, I guess, is my very short (laughs) summary of my long answer. I love it. I love it. I love it. You know, just because like, and I guess with Turner, like it just made sense with how the way that they played, especially once again, with Halburn, who's able to get downhill, it just didn't make sense why you'd leave somebody on the trade block for so long and just constantly shop them when he's been a valuable player, in my opinion, for the pace. Sure. He's had an up and down career, but I thought that he still added some sort of value that most teams were sought after, you know, and I don't know why you wouldn't want a a big that's that could stretch the floor and still a solid defender as well. I think in the past, you know, especially these last few years when he started with Sabonis, one of my frustrations with him, like I know that's the main thing that people point to, that it's a change in context. He's now at his natural position at the five, which does matter because for a long time, like even before Sabonis was on the team, when Thaddeus Young started, if they played a team like Utah when Rudy Gobert was still there, Rudy Gobert would guard Thad, not Miles. Or mm-hmm. they'd go to Philadelphia and Joel Embiid would guard Thad and Ben Simmons would guard Miles, which would then really marginalize Miles in the offense. So if he wasn't getting to pull an opposing five into the space, was he quote unquote really a stretch five? And then also the other impact of that is a lot of times he wasn't really stretching the defense. It was more so that teams were just, you know, willing to live with it, kind of like the Knicks. You know, they would assign Mitchell Robinson to him. They would have Mitchell Robinson sag off. And sometimes he'd give you more than he bargained for. He might hit seven threes against the Knicks. Other nights that wouldn't necessarily happen, but you know, he's not always been the best at finding his own usage and making quick decisions. And this year he's been better at that. Like, and just one thing that I would point to, like last year they played a game against Boston. It was, you know, makeshift lineup. So we're talking about like Dwayne Washington juniors out there, O'Shea Brissett's out there, like, you know, that, you know, they're into the bench guys are playing with him and Boston was fronting him with Josh Richardson, even though Robert Williams, Jalen, Brown and Jason Tatum were on the floor. Like that's who Emi Yudoka was guarding Miles with because they just didn't view him as a threat in the post at all. So now this year they're playing Boston and you'll see Miles is like, oh, he's actually getting now Horford assignment. He's making a tough shot or he's rolling to the rim against Robert Williams and, and dunking or he's getting a switch against Boston and they're actually bringing a double and he's scoring against the double team. He's just been a lot more decisive and patient in the post. And just like I said, a lot of things that I would not have projected from him last February he suddenly started to do them. So I think that the Pacers felt a lot more confident in that, knowing that he had rounded out other areas of his game as well. Okay. And you keep bringing up Sabonis. I just got to ask, what were your thoughts when that trade happened for, with, with Sabonis for, for Halliburton? Were you excited about it? Concerned about it? Because Sabonis has been, you know, you see what he's doing on the Kings right now. Obviously we saw what Halliburton was doing on the Kings and it was, did you feel like it was a fair trade? Were you excited to get Halliburton and move off Sabonis? Were you excited that Indiana made a splash move. What were your overall thoughts when that deal went down? Oh, I think it was mostly surprised because leading up into that trade deadline, um, before Miles had the stress reaction in his foot, all of the talking points was that if one of the bigs was getting moved, it was going to be Miles. That's mm-hmm. who they were going to move. I don't think they were anticipating moving Sabonis until the Kings, you know, made the shift and made Halliburton available. I think once Halliburton was available, you have to do that deal. Um, overall, I'm probably somebody who's more I've been over the last several years more favorable on looking at what Sabonis is than what most people are so I wasn't really out in the media being like ah this was this was you know this was 
theft on the part of the Pacers and like how much that trade got panned at the moment. So I didn't, did I think the Kings were going to be number two or number three in the West? No, but I think that I thought that Sabonis is capable of elevating a roster, but the problem with the Pacers that they had is they had one movement shooter last year. So Justin Holiday is the only guy who could be a movement shooter playing with Sabonis. He was the only person shooting over 35% at the point in time when that trade was made. They would literally play games like they were in Phoenix and Chris Paul looked at their bench and deliberately said they can't effing shoot back up. Like there was times or a lot of games where it practically looked like a reverse box and one against Sabonis where he's drawing like three defenders. Nobody's guarding anybody else on the floor. So like, In a sense, it was more impressive what numbers he was getting last year, even though he didn't make the all-star roster because everything was harder for him. But also everything was harder for him. And unless they moved him, they didn't really have a way to upgrade the shooting around him, like what you're seeing with the Kings and the offense that they're running. And also like Rick Carlisle is not somebody who really wants to run triangle concepts and the stuff that Mike Brown's kind of imported over from Golden State that's really made that offense sing. I don't think like Rick eventually adjusted to that as the season went on, but it took a while. Like, I don't think that that's really what style of basketball that he would prefer to play. So I think it all worked out in the long run. And like I said, the Pacers were heading into a spot where they needed to rebuild Tyrese is under contract on a rookie deal. Um, and I think very highly of him within, within four games of Tyrese playing for the Pacers, I was confident he was the best point guard who's played for the Pacers in my lifetime. So Ow. not, not a super high bar when you're looking at the cast of people that's there. It's kind of <laughs> like the Knicks and Jalen Brunson. Like you, you would, you would probably say the same thing with Jalen Brunson and Jalen's been fantastic this season, but oh, yeah. also like he's beating out, you know, look who the, the most recent point guards for the Knicks have been. <laughs> I mean, yeah, no one needs to go through Jose Calderon, Manuel Moutier, you know, oh my goodness. Actually, I'm going to stop right now because they'll just. <laughs> Put me in. It's gonna in, get sad. Bad time. It is. It is quite sad when you start going back. Ugh, Shane War. Oh my god. I think about Shane. Um. But yes, it, I I totally hear you on that. But at least we shared one point guard, which was Mark Jackson, <laughs> who played for Indiana. <laughs> Probably the most recent other good point guard for the Pacers. <laughs> for sure. For sure. But you mentioned Rick Carlisle talking about adjusting to adjusting the offense. What have your thoughts been about him take since taking over Indiana and the job he's done this season? Yeah, I think especially this season, he's impressed me more so than last year because, you know, going back to his prior six seasons in Dallas, he had never coached a team that was in the like they were in the bottom five, bottom 10 of transition frequency. And some of that has to do with Luca because Luca wants to play at a more methodical place, pace and hunt mismatches. And some of that can also be said for Malcolm Brogdon. He plays a more cerebral brand of basketball. But like last year after the trade was made, it was pretty evident that Tyrese is somebody like he practically jumps out of his skin. He wants the ball inbounded immediately. He wants to push off of makes. And their transition frequency went up for like a brief period of time, but then by the end of the season, it had fallen back again. And I was kind of like, you know, is he going to let go of the reins? Because you could see at spots last year where he was really doing quite a bit of pace control from the sidelines. He was calling a lot of plays. And, you know, is that going to be a fit for Tyrese? And he had made a comment along the lines of like, the idea of Tyrese and Brogdon playing together, where he'd been like, well, we have two point guards on the floor. I'm never going to have to call plays anymore. And I was like, ah, you're still calling quite a few plays. And then I thought like a really big turning point that hasn't really been the case for the majority of the season, but I thought a pretty big turning point was Tyrese came back and made a game winner a couple weeks ago against the Bulls with Patrick Beverly guarding him. And you could literally see on the broadcast that Rick was saying like, no timeout, like we don't want to play after the free throw, just bring it up. And Tyrese had said like, I want a different play. Like I want to call X and Rick completely acquiesced to that and let Tyrese make the call in that situation. The final two possessions of what play they were going to call. He stood back and like, he's really let Tyrese be the quarterback on the floor. Um, There's been less play calling. That was kind of his reputation and some of the, what was bumping heads or was reported that was leading to some of the bumping heads with Luca. So, and then the fact that they are the number two transition frequency team, like he's adapted to that. They play equal or they play early and opposite and transition a lot. Um, two side fast break stuff that they've incorporated that wasn't really the case last year so I think he's definitely adapted to the roster and the athleticism of the roster and and I think that you can point to some of that defensively as well too cool cool and like for like what would you say for for Rick that is something that Pacers fans really get on him about for like because when I look at Thibodeau and seeing the adjustments that he's made over the past three seasons right something that was always being harped on was you know, he doesn't stagger his rotations, you know, leaves guys in too long, which he did do that with Jalen Brunson, even though we had a good win against the Washington Wizards. You're like, yo, we got a minute left. We're up 18. Just take the guy out, man. But for like Tibbs, like he's really improved on staggering the rotations. Like RJ runs a lot with the second unit. When RJ was out for some time, you see Julius run with the second unit. Sometimes you get to see these lineups that we wouldn't necessarily see last season where 
you knew at every single moment throughout each quarter, you knew what lineups were coming in, how the game was going to close. And that's changed this season. So for Rick, what would you say has been the biggest gripe amongst the fan base with him? Yeah. So this year, I think it's what I said earlier that people sometimes think that he has too short of a leash on Benedict Matherin. That mm. like that in that game against Miami, he only played 13 minutes and people were very frustrated mm. with that after the game. I was not as critical because when you watch the game back within the first like five minutes that he was in, he made three really egregious defensive errors. And I think that they're trying to really um, instill in him that he needs to be a two-way player. And he started to take a little bit more pride in that. And like I said, it can't just be unconditional. Like he needs to get minutes, but you have to also earn them when you're out there. And then when they got into the second half, he had a play where one of Benedict's drawbacks is sometimes when a play is called for him, he doesn't realize that the shot isn't necessarily for him just because the plays run for him. So somebody came mm. off the strong side corner. He didn't make the kick out and took like a pretty contested layup right at the rim. And that was his last offensive possession of the game. So also trying to get him to make the right reads on the floor, but, um, and then just defensively from the heat, Tyrese was trying to get the Tyler hero matchup as most teams do. And whenever he got Tyler hero, they were trapping that. So if you know, they were playing Nemhard at the time, and it, it, Benedict has many things that he does better than Andrew, but slipping into space and making a play when somebody traps is not going to be one of them. Andrew's a better playmaker. So I thought strategically and because of some of the struggles Benedict was having in that game, it was fine. And I do think that it's impacted and, and led Benedict to take a little bit, especially you know these last few games where we're seeing him get like a key stop against Shea Gilgis Alexander at the end of the game. I see that more so as progress and probably something that's needed to happen this season. But a lot of fans are like, Hey, he needs those reps in closing time. And I think the accountability has been there from the top down of the roster. There's been other, there's been other games where it hasn't made sense to play Andrew. Like they were in Milwaukee. He was struggling against switches. They pulled Andrew, but um, that's probably the biggest gripe amongst the fan base is that they haven't fully leaned into always playing the young guys to the amount of minutes that mm. fans would like to see. But I think that it's actually probably helped their development sometimes when they don't get minutes, but that's just a differing point of view. No, I totally hear that. And I think that the same could be said for what Tom Thibodeau has done with this Knicks roster. A uh, big player in contention was always Emmanuel quickly because of the point guards that we've had previously in front of him, you know, whether it be, Two seasons ago, Alfred Payton, and you just see that you want manual shooting and just, you know, the just opening up the four spacing for Julius Randle attack. And when Alfred Payton couldn't hit the broad side of a mountain, right? And then last year we had Alec Burks running the point guard position and didn't really have the pace to get everybody into their set, into this, didn't have the pace to get everyone into the set and couldn't really run all the actions that you want to see from a normal uh, point guard. Now with the manual quickly, you know, you could say that over the three years, Thibodeau knew what he was doing because you watch quick this season when Jalen Brunson's out, he could run an offense, especially when he's locked in. He's still a more, he's still a good three point shooter, but he's added so much to his game to make him even more of a lethal guard because he can attack at all three phases. Now, you know, we we're seeing a mid range jumper that he didn't have the last two seasons. So I can totally hear the, the standpoint of like, yo, you want to hold the players accountable, especially when they're young, they're on that rookie contract. You want them to understand what it's like to be playing both ways. Like even for quickly, once again, he didn't come in here being known as a defender. Now as a two-way player, we have him for in sure. conversation for six man of the year. So totally understand where you're looking at, you know, player development, what goes into player development. It's not necessarily playing a lot of minutes. You know, I wrote an article not too long ago for like hoops habit, where I was like, yo, you need to give Kevin Knox a minute so that way he can learn. And I think it's just a balance of like, how many minutes do you give a young guy, but also what are the quality minutes too? So it's, 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 de it's a difficult balance, but when you're watching a team that's struggling, you're like, can we just watch the young guys? Can we just have some fun? Like, I would just want to, I don't yeah. need to see, you know, for us, like, I don't need to see Evan Fortier running out there for like 40 minutes for, for, for cardio, putting up shots. And I'm like, all right, is today going to be the day that he's going to be knocking them all down? Or is today going to be the day where he's just clanking off the back iron? But let's get into this game preview, Caitlin. And once again, we're talking to Caitlin Cooper. She is the creator of Basketball She Wrote. Caitlin, we got an interesting matchup here because Indiana's not playing a lot of their stars. They've switched up the roster. So for this matchup, I'm looking at Jalen Brunson versus Andrew Nebhard. And for we all know what Brunson's been doing this season. Uh, I could even argue that he's been most improved. You know, he was snubbed to being an all-star this year. Hopefully he gets some consideration for all NBA just because of how impactful he's been for the New York Knicks, even with Julius Randle out right now. You saw he just went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Donovan Mitchell, and he's showing why he's a star. 
for Andrew Nebhard. He's come onto the scene this season. He's been a shocker. Um, you know, the numbers aren't necessarily saying what they're, you know, how impactful he's been for Indiana, but he's totally been impactful for what Indiana wants to do this season and what they're looking to do for the future. So what do you think about this matchup? And are there any other matchups that you're looking at throughout this entire game? I think I'm really curious to see if it's going to be one because in the prior game, which Tyrese got hurt, I believe, right before, Right after halftime, I don't think he played most of the second half in that game in New York. And Nemard was guarding Brunson from the tip. And as I recall, they were really trying to force him to go right and icing the pick and rolls, especially when he was on the right side of the floor away from his strong hand and trying to get him and force him into the corner and then get him to pass the ball out of the, out of that. And he was just like tearing it apart. Like, I think he had like 15 points in the first quarter. He split those traps. He dribbled away from him and hit the mid range. Like it was not a super effective strategy. And also miles wasn't available in that game. So to a degree that that game's probably a decent blueprint for what we should expect from the next two, because Tyrese didn't play the second half and miles wasn't out there. So I am curious to find out if they will immediately try that strategy again, or if they'll go to what they did after halftime, which was, as you'll recall, they got really aggressive trapping and applying a mm-hmm. lot of pressure and trying to force Brunson to pass out of that. Cause you know, size is size. And for the many things that Brunson does well, if you put two bigger defenders on him and force him to pass out over those traps, there was some struggle there, especially getting the ball to the middle of the floor to Mitchell Robinson as a short roller. And then I felt like what you just said about Thibodeau, I felt like he was a little bit slow to make, to go to their small lineup. I don't think he actually pulled Robinson off the floor until there was like a minute and a half left to go in that game when mm-hmm. they probably should have been trying to play, in my opinion, Julius Randle at the five. But then on the flip side too, like would they put Brunson on Nemhard? Because in the prior games they have, but that's because Tyrese is available. So it's kind of like, let's let's hide Brunson over on Nemhard because he's not like a super aggressive guy when he's playing off the ball. You can probably bank and, and see if you can get away with some of Nemhard's shooting, but other teams have been trying to do that lately now that Nemhard's starting at point. So like they, they were up in Toronto and Nick Nurse started Will Barton against Nemhard at the point of mm-hmm. attack. And they put uh, OG on Buddy and Fred Van Vliet on Benedict Matherin, thinking that those were going to be the top two scorers. Well, Nemhard just ate against that. He had like 15 points in the first quarter. He had a terrific game against the Raptors. Will Barton, like all it was taking was a double drag screen and Will Barton was just getting lost. So I'll be interested to see how Tom Thibodeau views that matchup. Does he see it more of a threat to put the better defender on Nemhard, like to put Grimes on Nemhard at the point of attack and, and limit him and take them out of the pick and roll? Or does he see Benedict Matherin away from the ball and the fact that he's averaging 23 points per game over these last five? as a bigger threat and like let Grimes kind of blanket there if I were Thibodeau I'd probably lean towards putting him on Nemhard and really shutting down what they do there so that you're taking away Nemhard's playmaking but that's kind of what I see between the two of them yeah and you there's two things that you mentioned first I'm going to start off with the thing that's funny to me is just like Julius Randle at the five is it sounds like Tom Thibodeau's just that's absolutely not like we saw that in spurts actually towards the end of the season where now that we have Josh Hart uh Tibbs is more, I guess, open to the idea of playing Randall at the five to go small. We saw Jalen Brunson, Emmanuel quickly, Quinton Grimes, Josh Hart, and Randall out there once. And I was like, what am I watching right now? Are we actually going small? This is crazy because it seems like Tibbs is just, you'd say small ball, crazy. And obviously the thing that everyone wants to see for Obi to get minutes is Randall and the Obi combination. We saw like bits and pieces throughout the season. But it's just funny just to hear Randall at the five. It feels like just taboo in Thibodeau's world. But the other one that you talked about is trapping Brunson. And I think that's why you start to see Emmanuel quickly on the floor with uh, Brunson more so because when it was just Brunson, you didn't really have another ball handler out there that can bring the ball up the court. Grimes really struggled earlier this season. He would get a little flustered. Uh, I think actually it was against Indiana too where he got flustered trying to bring the ball up half court and he got caught uh, by the sideline. And I was like, hmm. You know, this is where you need someone like Emmanuel quickly. And so far, that's why in the closing lineups, you see Brunson quickly, Josh Hart, Randall when he's healthy, and then Mitchell Robinson or Isaiah Hartenstein. Hartenstein. And it's having quickly out there has been a safety valve for for Jalen Brunson just to continue to have that playmaking and shot creation. Um, Question for you, though, going back to the Pacers, you know, this team does, when they're fully healthy, they can put up points, right? I think they're 11th in the league right now when it comes to putting up points. Um, But you keep going, but you go down and looking at some more of the like stats and analytics and you see 22nd in field goal percentage, 21st in offensive rating. How is it that they're putting up so many points, but yet it doesn't translate to the other statistics right there. Right. It's all about the transition game for them. 
So that's in part why the Knicks probably aren't always the best matchup because they hit the offensive glass so hard. Like sending Mitchell Robinson to the glass makes it harder for the Pacers to leak out and do what they want to do. So that's one way that teams will limit them is because they are a very poor offensive rebounding team. They have to send a lot of guys there. Some of that goes to just not having a lot of great rebounders in general, but it also like their defensive scheme. They have to be in heavy rotation. They do a lot of trapping, like we mentioned. And when you do that, you tend to give up gaps and it's, it's harder to get offensive rebounds, but it also makes it difficult for them to set up what they want to do, because I think they rank like fourth in time to shoot their second in transition frequency. That's really their bread and butter, especially when Tyrese is available, but they've kept up the pace with TJ and Andrew as well, even though Tyrese has been out. So that's where they're most efficient. I think that when they're in the half court, they're like 24th in points per possession. Um, Mm -hmm. They don't have a lot of shot creators there. That's why they don't isolate a lot. It's pretty much like, you know, Tyrese is the engine. If you don't have somebody like that, when a team starts to switch out, then they can get a little bit more limited if they don't get to the next action. So you really want to contain them to the half court as much as possible. And one way to do that is to be really aggressive on the offensive glass. Okay. And then flipping to the other side of the ball defensively, you know, you look at the stats and defensive rating Pacers are 26. And I know defensive statistics aren't necessarily the best way to determine if they, if someone has a good defense or not, but for Indiana, would you say that their defense has been the biggest issue for this team so far? That's what they need to solve the most going into the off season. And I kind of feel this year, like going into the year, I didn't expect them to be a good defense. I thought they'd be in the bottom 10 just based off what the results were last year. Mm. But I wanted to be clear as to what the mission was on that end of the floor. Do I understand what they're trying to take away and what they're trying to accomplish? And I think that I do like they have, you know, a very aggressive presence at the nail. They want to protect the paint first and spray out the shooter second. Um, Miles's role has changed dramatically on that end of the floor where they have to a lot of times assign him to lower usage wings or if it's a big who doesn't shoot like Mitchell Robinson, he'll guard that person, but he'll be very brazen and helping off because he has to stay low around the basket because they're playing four guards. You know, when you're playing Aaron Neesmith at the four, a lot of times they'll cross match Neesmith onto the big so that they can switch all the ball screens, keep Miles around the basket. But the problem is, is they just don't have guys who can stay in front. Like Neesmith and Nemhard are better than what, you know, the situation is with Halliburton and healed. But even if you have like a complex screening action, sometimes Nemhard can get spun out as well. So you're seeing a lot of peel switching from them. And when you have a young team doing a lot of peel switching, sometimes, you know, that can lead to not necessarily having a hive mind and knowing where people need to get back out to the perimeter. So um, yeah, they have a lot of trouble staying in front on the give up a lot of blow buys, give up a lot, you know, of dribble penetration off of screens. So they kind of have to pack into the lane. And then the numbers that you would expect to see based on what your eyes are telling you isn't exactly what happens because they give up a very high rim fr- frequency, which, you know, fortunately miles is there to depress, but given how aggressive they are at bringing defenders over and pulling in, you would expect them to be giving up more from the three point line than what they are. So that's a pretty good indicator that, you know, there's cracks in what you're trying to accomplish given what the scheme's drilled to do. So that's, that needs to be number one on their off season to-do list. Okay. And then let's transition from the starters going to the bench now, because now that you don't have a lot of your starters there, you're elevating guys to be coming off from the bench. So for the battle of the benches, it's been interesting because the Pacers bench, the Pacers bench, like they're top when it comes to offensive rating, they're actually third, but once again, the defensive woes are there. What do you expect from the matchup between the Knicks bench unit and the Pacers bench unit? Yeah, I remember in the one home game that, you know, it was around the time when Isaiah Hartenstein was kind of still struggling with the Knicks, but in that particular game, like he didn't put up numbers, but they were playing him and Sims together at the same time. And then the Pacers were then matching playing big with Isaiah Jackson and Jalen Smith playing at the same time. And Isaiah is kind of somebody who I still don't fully understand what his most ideal pick and roll coverage is. Like he's ideally somebody who's a switch big and and can move laterally, but he takes some wrong steps Mm. and then drop coverage wise. He still hasn't really mastered the nuances of what depth he needs to be at. So a lot of times he's better being more proactive and jumping out above the level. So that's what they were doing against RJ because they had nobody who could really stay in front of him. But then it becomes tricky when Isaiah Hartenstein's on the floor and you're blitzing the ball handler because he was just like picking them apart off the short roll. So um, that's something that's out there. TJ McConnell has been terrific over these last five games. He's shooting like 68% from the field. They actually brought him back into the game to finish against the Thunder and he kind of iced out the Thunder with some three or four, you know, pull up middies like he's known to take. So TJ has been kind of on a heater, but yeah, as you say, when you're having to promote, you've promoted Benedict Mather into the starting lineup. TJ has been in the closing lineup. So 
you are depleted there. And then they've had some kind of, you know, wonky units at times where like we're seeing like Jalen and Ajax and Bursette and Wara all playing at the same time, which is like the opposite of the four guard lineups they've been playing all year. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if that tilts toward the Knicks kind of like what the whole game will most likely be like. <laughs> yeah. And I'm looking at this for, for the bench unit. I obviously I think the Knicks got the advantage on this on this one right here, especially with the addition of Josh Hart. And if depending if RJ is back for any of these games, because I know he was out last time with an illness, if Quickly and Hart are back on the bench together with Hartenstein, it's just they've just been so dynamic. Whether it's quickly finding Hartenstein, utilizing the quickly Hartenstein pick and roll, which has just been something that's been a pleasant thing to see because it allows Hardenstein to work the high post and start pa using his passing chops, whether it was like to Miles McBride in the last matchup or finding Josh Hart, who's cutting or even finding Quentin Grimes, I believe on some occasions, like the having using Hart's passing ability just is just giving, it's just opened up a lot for the Knicks offense, just create creatively. And then with quickly and Hart, like they're just a duo of a backcourt to, to be reckoned with, whether it's Hart's physicality, quickly shot creating and now playmaking and even I should even say hard playmaking because hard playmaking is up there as well. So I think for the Knicks, this is going to be an advantage to them, but you know, there's TJ McConnell still who always likes to give some problems. Uh, is he, is he coming off the bench or is he starting now? Yeah, he's coming off the bench, but like I said, he has been in the closing lineup where they did have him finish against the thunder. And it was kind of wild to a degree because it was just like down the stretch, just get a screen wherever Shea Gilgis is like, just put Shea Gilgis into action um, get lower than Shea Gill, just turn the corner, make a midi. And then to the point where they ended up actually putting Lou Dort on TJ. And not only just like when TJ was playing off the ball, like that's what, how concerned they were with him getting into the paint because he was causing enough problems. So yeah, I mean, he's been an engine. He's been, he's been playing really well for them over the last five and those shots that, you know, sometimes that can be a little fickle. Sometimes he can go through stretches where they aren't hitting, but I feel like I can't remember the last time he's missed one right now. So um, yeah, he, he's played well for them and he doesn't know, he doesn't seem aware that like it would probably be better for the Pacers to be losing games right now. Not that players are ever are aware of that, <laughs> but you know, they have, they have picked up some wins here lately getting a win over the thunder getting a win over the raptors so and ones that you know you wouldn't expect them to where they've proven to be feisty so but isn't that what you like to see don't you like to see so like that feisty nature in a team that's down some players because even though i get wanting a better draft pick you also want to see that you actually have some talent on this team mm -hmm. so are, are you in that camp or would you just rather see this team just completely go all in and go get Wemby? i mean I think it would be better for them to add another long-term piece because let's face it, the Pacers aren't the Knicks. They're not going to get somebody like Jalen Brunson to come sign with them in free agency. But I do think that they have had positive strides from guys and that this has been a good learning experience for them for the reasons that I just said. Like when they did play the Thunder, they put Benedict Mather, well, they didn't put him on him. He got switched. Shea got a switch against Benedict. Benedict made a good stop. He didn't bite on two shot fakes, used an op opposite hand contest. Shea misses the shot. Like that's valuable, you know, going into next season to be giving him those types of reps against those types of guys in closing time minutes. So um, you can't, you can't be too down when they get a win in those types of circumstances. I'll put it that way. I hear you on that. I hear you on that. But Caitlin, I appreciate you uh, breaking down this game with me. What we're, we're going to get to your section on, on just giving you some hype because of the article that came out for you, but what is your score prediction for these two games coming up? Well, the Knicks have had a pretty high powered offense. I guess it depends who all is available for them. Do you think RJ is going to be back? Like, I think he'll be back. Yeah. I think that I wouldn't be surprised if the Knicks score over 125 in this game, wow. just because of what the Pacers have been. I mean, they've, they've had some games here lately where they've been giving up close to 140. So um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's a very high scoring game between both teams. Wow. Um, 140. That's crazy. I can't even, it's, it's first of all, the things that you said, it's just like, we're not like the Knicks who can get someone in free agency. That has just been different for just watching that happen. And then you're saying Knicks scoring prowess. That's another thing. I can't even believe that's just hearing. Uh, I'm going to go, I'll, I'll go probably 120 paces like this step up, especially McConnell. McConnell has something against the Knicks. I don't know what it is. I'm going to go. I, I don't, so I guess it could be like 120 Knicks and then like 112 Pacers just because you're missing so many key players. I feel like that's what I think. I feel like that's what will happen. And I think that 
it'll be a high scoring affair because we don't have Julius. We don't have some guys to really wear out the opponents. Like Julius, like even though he's not the greatest defender because of his physicality, it wears on opponents, yep. which makes them get tired on the other end of the floor. And with Obi, you could say it's the same thing because he'll keep running in transition all day long, which will put some pressure just for cardio wise. But um, mm. it's just different how both of them play. One is going to be like, are you go? Do you want to exi- like exert so much energy running back and back and forth up and down the court trying to contain somebody? The other one is like, do you have the strength to 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 work somebody? So it'll be interesting to see how that how that dynamic plays out. But I think it's going to be somewhere around there. But Caitlin, we gotta go into the next sec- section because there's a there was a recent article published about you, um, by I'm sorry, uh, uh, Stephen No, I I'm, hopefully I'm pro- uh, pronouncing his name right for Sporting News, and I just find it so amazing that you got your time to shine because of the amount of work and effort that you put into your your craft and really offer a different perspective on basketball that isn't really written too time too frequently in the nba world because you really break it down from whether like i said it's benedict matherin's jab uh jab stepping it's whether it's the uh, jump passing by tyrese halliburton i mean you even wrote stuff about what was it isaiah jackson and his outlook for like the indiana pacers not too long ago so with that you know, how did it feel to have one an article written about you and bring your work to shine? <laughs> yeah, I don't think I would have ever expected that to happen. I mean, this whole season's been kind of a roller coaster between, you know, finding out midway through that Vox was no longer going to be supporting any cornrows, trying to figure out what outlet I was going to find and land with, and then trying to get the Patreon up off the ground. And then obviously Steph was nice enough to write that story. And and I say this a lot, but people always ask me, cause you know, Tyrese did wear one of the shirts that I made and he had, mm-hmm. when I got let go, he did tweet something in support and been like, you know, it was like, shout out Caitlin. I think that almost says more about him than it does about me. Like, I just think he's like, I've said this before, like he's, if you tried to create a fan favorite in the lab, I think it would be Tyrese Halliburton, but that almost seems unfair to him because he's very, he's not artificial. He's very genuine with what he wants to do. So um, that was very kind of him. The quotes that he had in that article was very kind of him. But, you know, I do put in a lot of work. I want to provide a slight like, different angle. And some of that comes from a lot of years of not necessarily having access. So I had to differentiate myself from other people in the market to a degree. And I knew like, hey, you know, I can spend two weeks clipping all of Tyrese's jump passes and analyze this. I might not be able to write a feature on him, but I can tell you about a specific quirk of his game and whether that's successful or not. Or, you know, I, it came clear to me, like I knew I wanted to write. Benedict was having such, you know, a standout rookie season, especially early in the season I wanted to watch all of his usage and when I did I was like wow this guy plays in triple threat a lot more than anybody I can remember in recent memory and how is that getting him advantages is there drawbacks to it um and then it turned out that you know it's it's very effective for him in terms of using the jab and go especially going to his left so um I think it's just me being curious by nature and wanting to find unique angles that hopefully aren't being told other places and you know also I cover a team that there's not a lot of people covering it like there's probably only four or five people who are really committed to that beat and work at you know major outlets or who write or podcast about them regularly so it's a little bit easier to stand out to a degree when you're in a smaller market because I know that there's a lot of people yourself included who are very talented covering the Knicks. The Knicks have a very large media contingent um, covering them on a regular um, basis. So. Yeah. I I want to put it, you know, like I, I think it's just, um, what what am I going for? You know, don't sell yourself short. It's just that you're just covering for like a small market team and stuff like that. Like your work stands out regardless. Like I think if you wrote about the Knicks, if you wrote about any other team that you chose to, even in major media market, it would just stand out just because of how detailed it is. And you talked about in your article on, you know, your father's a coach, you, you know, you, you get to see it through a coach's lens and how you are able to dissect this game, which I think, you know, you, you talked about, it helps you, but it also helps us because you have that ability to not only look at through a coach's lens, but break it down in a way where it's comprehensive for someone like myself, who, when I read this, I'm like, Oh, you know, this is how you utilize like a screen, you know, whether it's like, or even a ghost screen, something of that, simple of that nature, right? Or how you utilize like your movements, your, your, the positioning of the body, like all that type of stuff is so critical to what you do, which is why it's amazing. I mean, look, you're even getting praises from Rick Carlisle. You know, he said, you know, this is the quote from the article. Her work is very compelling. It's very detailed. 
certainly in depth and it's unique because it comes from a perspective of real basketball knowledge, not just analytical knowledge we see your work a lot and have great respect for it and you talked about Tyrese Halliburton wearing your shirt too right but and he's also giving your flowers on uh the jump passing because he likes to utilize it a lot right his quote is I appreciate people who pay attention to the little nuances of the game obviously the work it took for her to do the article was super cool and I appreciate it beca because my whole life I've been told not to jump and pass so I appreciate having someone on my side and I think that when you're starting to see, you know, only teams recognize it. Everyone recognizes it. You know, even Chris Herring has retweeted you so many times. Um, your articles have been, look, you even published for, what was it? It was a 538 that you wrote for, right? And, and just the detail you do, go through looking at Eric Gordon in that article is just very impressive. So your work is just, you know, just want to give you your flowers on how thoughtful, how appreciative, like how much I appreciate it because I learn a lot, even though it's not my team. I still get to learn something to take to my knowledge and what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's covering the Knicks or just talk about NBA worldwide. So really appreciate everything that you've done. Um, with your dad being a coach, did you ever think, like, I know you said you don't want to, I think you said you don't want to be a coach because of all the stuff that goes in there, but did you ever think about wanting to work for like an NBA team? Because the amount of film that you go through to break all this stuff down, it's like, it is truly NBA worthy. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's something that I've considered. I've talked to a few just kind of on like a get to know you type basis, like especially right now, like teams weren't necessarily hiring in the middle of the season, but they're like, hey, you know, if something comes up, you're a person of interest and maybe, you know, like an invitation to apply type of a thing for different positions. But I think part of it for me is like the more I know about basketball, I think I find out how much more I don't know. So there is like an intimidation factor of like sometimes when you talk to people behind the curtain, it's like, oh, wow, I would not have even thought to look for that. Like, I, and, and, you know, I, I think it's a good thing, especially from a writer perspective, because I am very curious and that pushes me to constantly be wanting to learn more from people who I think are smarter than me. But it also is um, somewhat intimidating as well and wondering, like, you know, what if I what if I get in there and I'm in over my head? <laughs> like, would I be able to get back into media at that point? Like, um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's something that I've thought about. But like I said in that article, I do know from a coaching standpoint that I think a lot of people think that coaching is just all about X's and O's. And I think even at the NBA level, that's a very tiny piece of it. I think you have to be very good at, you know, motivating and getting, getting people to buy into roles and really selling what you want to do and building relationships with players so that they, you know, want to perform on the floor. I think that that all plays into it. And I don't necessarily think that those are particularly my strengths. My strengths are, you know, sitting alone and staring at my laptop and trying to figure out, you know, how are the Pacers getting, how is this four or five pick and roll with Jordan Nawara being so effective when it doesn't seem like it should be? <laughs> you know, Tibbs does that all the time. You know, Tibbs is locked away in some sort of room and it seems like that's why he has to have guys like Johnny Bryant, Mike Woodson, Kenny Payne, you know, so don't never say never. Caitlin. Does never it, doesn't never. he have the, doesn't he have the quote where he says he's married to basketball? I think, yes. I think that's Tibbs. Yes, yes, yes. That is, that is Tom Thibodeau. Uh, last question for you about this. What do you think has been the most interesting thing? Because you talked about like your curiosity, your curiosity and constant research. What do you think has been the most interesting, your favorite article that you did, the most in-depth, nuanced research on? I mean, the most time-consuming was definitely the Tyrese one because I had to rewatch 26 basketball games and watch all of his minutes and watch all of the passes and then catalog them. But another one that I liked that I wrote, I think during the hiatus – was, you know, the idea of bigs as ball handlers and not just like in the half court and inverse pick and roll situations, but bringing the ball up the floor. And so there was times during that season where Nate McMillan started to give, you know, Sabonis a little bit of leeway to be like a grab and go big. So I watched all of his rebounds and then clipped them all to see like, is did he push and what happened on the possessions when he brought the ball up the court? And it was kind of revealing because he would immediately go into like DHO handoffs with contact with Doug McDermott, but it was almost always on the left side of the floor. And in part, that's because Doug likes to shoot moving to his right. But if there was like any sort of resistance at all, it got dicey with his handle and he didn't want to go right. And you could really see that development, especially last season, like when they were going through the Omicron depletion that pretty much every NBA team was like mm -hmm. Rick gave Sabonis a lot more point responsibilities than he had had over his prior seasons. And you could kind of see him like, Oh, he has a left to right cross over, you know, a brush screen and transition. And now he's making a pass to his right. Like, being able to really track those types of developments and how these guys, especially when they're at an all-star level, can still improve. Um, that one will be one of my favorites. I think it was, you know, I think I called it 
analyzing DeMontis Sabonis doing point guard things, I think is what I mm. called it. So, you know, now we are seeing like, obviously Jokic is the originator of that, but we are seeing more and more big, sometimes even off of inbound passes, just being the guy bringing the ball up the floor because it makes it easier, you know, to not have to enter the ball to them in the post and what that can be, you know, if, especially if teams guard guys with smaller guys, like if you're facing somebody like OG on an above the break, you know, it's harder to run delay than if you're just the guy bringing the ball up the court. So I think I would point to that one. Okay. Okay. And uh, I'll definitely check that one out. But Caitlin, thank you so much once again for coming on to the show and previewing the Knicks versus the Pacers for the remaining two games that they got this week. Uh, please let our listeners know where they can find you. If you got anything coming up and yeah. Right. So my handles at C2 underscore Cooper, the Patreon's patreon.com slash basketball. She wrote the subtitles, a blog about the basketball played by the Indiana Pacers. It is obviously a Pacers centric blog, but like you said, I like to think that if people go over there and read the unlocked content that um, maybe it can help you learn a little bit more about your team and what your team is or isn't doing. Um, so there's that aspect. Most of that content's unlocked, but there is some that's behind a paywall. I do a monthly mailbag that I put a lot of attention into. If people want to ask questions, I'm very thorough with that. So um, and then, you know, I'm just looking ahead to the games with the Knicks this week and seeing what stories there are going to be to tell from those. So awesome. Okay. Well, thank you once again for coming through and to Knicks nation salute to all of you for checking in, make sure to hit that thumbs up button for everybody here today and make sure to subscribe to the channel. Also make sure to check out KnicksFanTV.com. and we'll catch you later after the Knicks play the Pacers this week for post game. All right, everyone. We out. <laughs>